morning, everyone, and welcome back to Reinforce the Horse. Today we are here with Kate Solisty, and Kate is the president of Kinship Enterprises and is dedicated to giving animals a say in their care and in our world. Kate is a leader in the field of interspecies communication, having translated animals' thoughts, feelings, and needs to caring humans since 1992. Kate has authored six books published in nine languages and co-edited a seventh with author and playwright Michael Tobias. She is an inspiring teacher and speaker, a recognized expert in dog and cat nutrition, flower essence therapy, and energy healing, addressing the whole animal, body, mind, and spirit. Kate's passion is giving voice to all members of the animal kingdom so that they can participate with human beings and in improving their own health and well-being, as well as, well as that of all species and the planet. To that end, she hosts a membership community, the Harmony Pack, where people passionate about the non-human beings on earth can learn from each other and collaborate for the good of all life. She lives with her husband, Marcus, and two fabulous felines in Vermont. Very cool. Well, thank you, Kate, for joining us. My this pleasure. Fabulous. So we've introduced you a bit. Uh, would you like to just go ahead and expand, maybe fill in some, some gaps or, uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. It's it's just sweet to be with you both and to have the opportunity to talk about horses. Um, horses, of course, are so important in the work that I do in, and in our our relationships with with animals, because, of course, horses have been partnering with human beings for such a long time. And the three there's there was a story that I was given about three species who really are here to help us find our way back to love and back to source. And of course, that's the dog, the cat and the horse. And they have very special ways of doing that. They all carry some different frequencies. And as everybody knows, so some people are dog people, some people are cat people, some people are horse people, some people love everybody. The dog, of course, carries unconditional love and manifests unconditional love very obviously. Cats express unconditional love in, in a way that's also detached love. Um, as we know, some people who don't really get cats thinks they're, think they're Ill, aloof and distant. But of course, once you're loved by a cat, you know, it's, it's very different. And horses carry the quality of idealism. And idealism is, is defined as persistent hopefulness. And if you've ever really known and loved a horse and been loved by a horse, you know that they carry this incredible optimism and, and really faith, um, in us, or why would they still be with us with all the ways we have misunderstood and, and mistreated them, uh, throughout the centuries. And of course, love and even passion. in uh, present day, for sure. Of course. So for me, um, I have, I have had the wonderful opportunity to work with people one-on-one -on -one with their horses. And then I've also taught, um, uh, dear friends had an international school for professional horsemanship in Belgium, and I was able to teach some classes there and help help students work with horses and understand them energetically as well as physical beings, and also begin the process of of learning to open their hearts to communicate more more accurately and more deeply. So that was always a lot of fun. And when I say professional horsemanship, um, my friend Marion who ran the school, um, was raised in dressage and European school of dressage, German and Dutch, which of course, as you both know, is, is a pretty rigorous and not always kind to the horse, <laughs> um, system. But she, uh, was working with her students to develop a, a level of trust that would eliminate the need for the heavy duty bits and all that, you know, the paraphernalia with dressage that is so huge. I mean, it's like, how do you move? How do you function with all that stuff around your nose and in your mouth and around your jaw and all of that? And she was working much more with what we might call natural horsemanship within dressage, which, which was all about going back to a relationship based on love and trust, not on manhandling your horse's mouth. <laughs> 
So um, that was a pleasure for me to be able to contribute to uh, that level of reframe on dressage. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know much about dressage. Do you, Alyssa? I don't know if we've really bit. talked much about it. Yeah. I have a few friends who have trained or are training in dressage, so I have a little bit of knowledge on it, but not by much. Well, it might be nice, you know, it might be fun for you guys to talk to some dressage uh, people, especially those that are, you know, open to more holistic horsemanship. Um, but dressage evolved out of very intricate footwork that the cavalry officers did with their horses back in the 19th, back in the um, 18th and 19th centuries. And so it was a way of competing to show the incredible talent of their, of their horses. That's how it began. And then it grew into a sport. And it is interesting to feel these different sports and disciplines from the perspective of the horse. And that's where, you know, that's where I come in is how do horses feel about X, Y, and Z, whatever activity they're doing, their the equipment they're wearing, uh, the way they, you know, what they're eating, how they're pastured, how they're, you know, everything is, of course, my job and my pleasure is to bring people uh, into awareness of what their horses think and feel. So are you an animal communicator? I am. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? Because this is, and Alyssa has a, a decent amount of experience with it. Uh, I do, but not by going through a course or training. I have experience just being around the horses and feeling like they're communicating with me in, in different respects. But you mentioned this idea of idealism and persistent hopefulness. Can you elaborate on that as it relates to their willingness and ability to communicate with us? Absolutely. Sure. Great, great question. Um, that's, that's a super question, Jason. Um, first, an animal communicator or interspecies uh, communicator um, or even interspecies intuitive communicator. <laughs> um, these are some of the phrases that we are working a little bit more with is the, in, the IIC, interspecies intuitive communicator, because of course the ability to connect heart to heart with an animal can also be done with trees and plants and sea creatures and all beings. Um, so, and your ability, both of you to just tune in and do it because it's, it's who you are. That's what happened to me. I did not, I wasn't, I didn't go to any classes or I didn't study with any teachers. Um, and so I had it as a child. Um, you know, my earliest memories are of connecting that way. So what you're doing is perfect and beautiful and it's a birthright to all of us, um, that we have that connection if we are willing to open our hearts. And so that's the, that's the piece about animal communication. Um, so your brilliant question about idealism and persistent hopefulness, um, what we're, what I'm referring to there is this deep inner quality of the horse. And if you think about the unusual being that they are, I mean, here is this big prey animal with four little hooves <laughs> who, uh, you know, has, has ranged in different continents and survived on, in very harsh environments in a lot of places. Um, and so what is it that keeps them going? And what is it that, that also keeps them standing by human beings through thick and thin? And even when, you know, you might think they should have given up and, you know, walked off. Um, that is that quality of, persistent hopefulness. We can hopefulness that the human will wake up and, uh, and that they will awaken through the heart connection with a horse. And I'll, I'll describe a little bit of what I mean by that in a second, so that the human really, again, the idea is to find our way back to interconnectedness, to unity with all life and ultimately source, which is simply divine love, which is what is in every living being <laughs> um every being and would you say regardless of belief system philosophy religion or otherwise because i you know i come from a 
a Christian background <laughs> growing up, but always feeling like that kind of put us in sort of a box. Whereas my feeling was that really there's just this divine and it's called source in some ways or the universe or God. There's this divine connection that we all have the more we've worked with animals and nature. And then this ultimately wraps back around through like indigenous beliefs uh, from long, long ago that we ultimately stem from, you know, call it shamanism or, or those types of things. Absolutely. So yes, um, it is, it is, you know, a, a simpler way to look at it is there's, there's religion and there's a spiritual um, connection. And the two don't necessarily <laughs> go together. If I have to say, am I religious or uh, I, I will say that I'm spiritual, which means I believe in that connection to source, God, creator, uh, all of those different names. Um, and many, and of course, every religion has a, a different name for that creative divine source. Um, but yes, I think it belongs to all of us and it is a universal energy that loves every living being. So um, that's why for me, it doesn't go in boxes at all, <laughs> any boxes. Um, and sometimes boxes are helpful. I, I recognize and, and, and respect that because people sometimes need that structure in order to blossom. It's kind of like, you know, a flower in a pot can be just as beautiful as a wildflower. That is what works for some people. And if they find their connection to love and 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 God and Creator and divine uh, love through a structure that is called religion uh, or philosophy or belief system. All of that is, if it ultimately leads them to love, it's all good by me. Have you seen that being around and with the horses has like helped people and or yourself find more of that spiritual side of them? That's a wonderful question, Alyssa. Yes. In a, in, in, to, the short answer is yes. If one it opens one's heart and enters into a relationship of trust with a horse, it opens up a whole world, right? You know what that is. Mm -hmm. And this, this trust that happens is, is, it has to be reciprocal, right? The horse has to trust you and you have to trust the horse. And I, I refer to that as a surrender. And what I mean by a surrender is completely letting go of your ego, completely trusting your heart and that the horse wants to trust you back. And when that happens, there's a merging, a, a interweaving uh, of the souls of the horse and the human. That is a gift. That is a huge gift. And horses, this is, this is part of how they take us back home to source is they remind us of this incredible connection. Now we can have it on the ground with a horse, but it really happens when we're on their back, right? Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> I hear that. I feel that like my whole being is like glowing right now. I that see that. So. <laughs> yes. That's the magic. Yes. That's the gift. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Thank you. That, that, yeah. That's the special, special gift. Um, is that, again, that mutual surrender into trust. When communicating with animals, primarily horses, have you found that with any sort of, I guess, amount of connection and uh, riding or whatever, have you found that, that that connection amplifies the communication in any way, shape, or form? Or the communication oh. helps amplify the connection with them? Uh, that's that's great. I think you kind of answered your own question. The, when you are connecting heart to heart with a horse, it amplifies the connection and it amplifies the ability for you to receive information from them. Yes. So let me ask you, Alyssa, when you are receiving communication from Willow, what do you, how does it come to you? Uh, I have like heard her in my head if that makes sense, but primarily a feeling. I can almost always feel what she's needing or wanting at any given time. And then she just like makes that 
more evident with her body language that she gives me afterwards. So, Kate, how does it come through to for you when you're communicating with animals? And does it differ based on the species of animal that you're communicating with? Um, it comes to me in pictures and feelings and thoughts, which I refer to as telepathy. So a thought to thought communication. So if I'm working with a person and their horse and we need to find out what's wrong, why is there lameness? Let's say, what's that about? What I do, and again, I've been doing this for over 30 years. So I kind of have honed my focus, if you will, so that I can uh, zero in. But I also use, I also zero in in multiple ways. So let's say as an example, there's a horse that's lame and the person needs to find out what's going on with that leg. Well, what I will do first is ask permission of the horse if, if I may um, communicate with them and, and will they be willing to share what's going on with their body? You know, what, what is it? And, and, and also maybe what happened if there was an injury, what caused it? And then we can also run through what things make it better, you know, and, and oftentimes people have been trying different things. They might have been trying a medication or ice or heat or, or acupuncture or chiropractic, you know, there's all different kinds of treatments that people can be doing. And we can check in with the horse to find out what's helping and what isn't. So the, so in terms of the communication, if I have their permission, one of the first things I do is, again, if we have a, an, uh, an illness or an injury, and as I said, an example would be lameness, is I, I want to see and feel into that leg that seems to be where the swelling is or, or the lameness and see what I can feel energetically. So do I feel an energy blockage? Do I feel heat? Do I feel cold? Do I feel that there's a the, there's a block in terms of the flow of circulation and energy is not happening? Do I feel pain? Do I perceive pain? I shouldn't say I don't feel the pain in my body, which is a good thing because you not you, you really don't want to do that. Um, that can be very exhausting, but I can perceive it. Some some people do pains. though, right? Yes, they do, some, and yeah. that's tough. Mm -hmm. That's a tough way to receive. It's better yeah. if you can kind of detach from it so that you can perceive it understand it, but not feel the pain in your own body. So I will try to locate it and then try to describe it to the person with the animal's words. So that's why I do the thought to thought or telepathic connection so that we can get as much information in addition to the feelings that I'm getting, right? Of cold, warm, swollen, hot, you know, all of that. Ouch. You know, it hurts when I do this. It doesn't hurt when I do that. Um, uh, you know, so it's a combination. Another way of receiving is if the question is, well, how did this happen? If there was uh, an accident or an injury when they were out in the field, let's say, they will often show me a picture of that or even a little movie. I did that with a client in uh, England. So of course, this work works long distance. I do not have to be with the person and the horse um, or any animal. I can I can work long distance. So I was going to tell the story about this horse in England who what came up lame and his person called me and I knew this horse. I'd actually met him in person <laughs> and he was very funny. He was an Irish, Irish horse. And so he had a sense of humor <laughs> um, and uh, his name was Brock. And so Brock was lame and they had been doing all kinds of things to, you know, check the hawk, check check him all. And they couldn't find out what was wrong. Why was he still limping? Blah, blah, blah. Where should, should they do an injection? What should they do to treat it? Yada, yada. But one of the first things to do is try to find out what was the source of the pain, right? So he showed me a picture of the field and there was something jutting out of the ground, which to me looked like a pipe. And then his person said to me, well, Oh, wow. She said, you know, it's been very muddy. It had been very rainy and muddy, and then it got very dry. So the, then the, the pasture got very hard. The, you know, the earth got, had been very muddy and then got very dry and hard. And, um, but she said, where in the pasture? And I'm like, you know, cause of course I, I'm not seeing the pasture. I, I can only depend on Brock. And he basically says the Southeastern corner of the pasture. I have to trust this because I'm not there. I just have to say, okay, Tanya, 
He says it's in the southeast part of the pasture. So <clears throat> she, so we finish our call and she goes to look and she finds that some branches had fallen down out of a tree and a branch had been embedded in the mud, but when it hardened, it stuck up like a pipe sticking out of the, out of the earth. And when he stepped on it, it went into the very tender frog of his hoof and it bruised his frog. And so then he started limping because it, it was it bruised and very tender. So what that's what he told us. So again, she found the branch <laughs> And then she talked to the vet, and indeed they found out by doing some probing right on his frog that, ouch, that was the soreness. It wasn't his hawk. It wasn't his stifle. It wasn't, you know, and that's where animal communication can be so, so helpful because we don't want to treat something that's not the problem, right? Um, so that's just a story of pictures, feelings, and communication te telepathically from him. So yeah, does that answer the question? That is, that is yeah. really fascinating. So in my mind, like ancient indigenous cultures, the term that comes to mind for me is shamanism. And correct me if I'm wrong there. It seems like we are in this phase of human evolution to where we are actually willing to accept this sort of stuff much more. Going back to our roots, of those indigenous cultures because back then they they allowed it and it was accepted widely accepted they they literally healed people through through this type of work and that's happening now and it has been happening for hundreds if not thousands of years what do you think is the catalyst for that shift back to those roots it it's a shift back to wholeness right back to uh uh back away from separation because i really feel that the the greatest problem for humanity is our separation separation from our inner self separation from our families separation from our communities separation from our countries and regions and blot right but most importantly separation from the earth our mother and and of course the father energy of source of god of light of you know and because we're all of that we are children of the earth we belong here we are just as much an integral part of the earth as the elephants as the bees as the dolphins as the birds right i mean this we we are all here together and as you mentioned jason the indigenous cultures lived in that harmony lived in that balance, knew that <clears throat> when that balance is upset, it causes all kinds of issues. It causes all kinds of problems, uh, not just for humans, but for other beings. And so the idea of ceremony uh, and uh, ceremony is really a way of bringing yourself centered and grounded and connecting with the, with the true beauty and uh, soul, spirit of all life, of all, and, and, and in certain search, ah, excuse me, certain situations, you want to connect, for example, the buffalo or deer dance that the Native Americans do is to connect with the spirit of the buffalo or the deer in order to ask them to give their lives so that the human beings can live. And in return, the human beings will respect and honor every part of that gift from the fur to the hoof to the antler to the bones to the blood to the meat to the, the whole being because they accept and recognize there's a great gift being given here. And this is what happens between predator and prey animals is a recognition of the gift that's being given. Um, so, you know, I, I did have the honor of knowing an, a, a hunter from Pennsylvania, a deer hunter, who was not native. He was, you know, uh, as white as can be. <laughs> you know, his mm -hmm. family was, I don't know, German and, you know, different mix of things. But he instinctively knew that he must perform a ceremony to honor the deer before he would ever hunt. And so he would do a ceremony around the fire, and he would give a gift 
and he would ask that the deer would grant him the gift of its life, and always one deer would present itself to him. And he yeah, would I've, always I've honor I've heard a number that. of stories like that. That that kind of touches my heart. It goes off of everything yeah. that I've been hearing and uh, working toward myself. Bless your heart. Yeah, and I'm we've, so glad. <laughs> we moved off grid to... 10 acres of rural land about half a decade ago and started a farm at the time for me, it was just like, yeah, we'll have animals and no problem, you know, uh, when it comes to raise them for food and stuff like that, but had a drastic shift in that way. I'm largely vegetarian now, uh, just by virtue of what I've seen. And now it puts it in perspective, like how, food is processed and sold at a very, very large scale. And when you are able to see that at an even small scale on a small farm, it it really puts it into perspective uh, for me. Do you find yourself getting a lot of pushback or maybe when you first started as a communicator, because you, you talked about this coming to you as a child. So did you find yourself getting a lot of pushback or, you know, oh, that's too woo-woo or <laughs> you're making this stuff up sort of stuff when you were beginning? That's great. Let me, I do want to circle back to your question about, you know, are we, are we as, are we waking up is the better way I would uh, answer yeah. it to, to this interconnectedness of all life. I think there is a great awakening happening and I am so grateful because again, having you know, I'm 65. And so, you know, seeing more and more people opening up like Alyssa, I mean, it's just, it just makes, it, it makes me so happy. Um, young people and people of different ages waking up to their, to this connection gives me so much joy because it's, it's, it's where I live. It's, it's for me, it's so critical to the future of all life on earth that we wake up and more and more people are doing that. And it's, so some of it is, you know, we can say that it's going back to our roots as interconnected with the planet, but it's going to look different because we are a technological society, but we can still do that in balance. We, you know, the idea that we, when I was, I uh, just digress a little, um, the, I do with my Harmony Pack, my membership community, we, I, I bring through wisdom from the wild animals primarily, although we talk dogs and cats and horses too. Um, but I, I, we were having a conversation with the seals and the seals were talking about plastic. Now they didn't call it that, but when they described it and I saw what they meant, that's what it was. And they said, you know, human beings created something that's incomplete. And we, you know, I just kept listening and they said, well, everything in nature has, it is, it is born, it grows, it matures, and then it begins to, it's dying off and it then returns to the earth or the sea. And, you know, the whole process begins again, but plastic doesn't disintegrate. It doesn't go back to the earth. It sits there. So if humans created it three quarters of the way, they can, they can fix it and come back and, and finish it so it can be complete. And the brilliance of that is there are whole bunches of scientists who have created plastics that totally decompose, that they have partnered with the, the mushroom community and the, and there are some certain bacterias that will break down plastic, but we also have to stop producing it in this crazy way. So, so the good news is, that there's this movement of connection and awareness that must be uh, applauded and and screamed from the hilltops. You know, this is happening. This is real. This is this is the this is what we are capable of. All this all this recreation of balance with our great intellect, with our great creativity. So again, it doesn't mean we're going to be living the way indigenous people did. That's not where, what we're doing here. We're creating a society that works in balance with nature, using our, our brilliant minds and our creativity. And that is happening. So that's, that's how I wanted to answer that question, Jason. I, I think a lot of people 
will hear the ties back to indigenous culture or and and be like, well, I don't you know, I, I love my modern day amenities and those sorts of things and, and the technology, which I do as well. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I don't you know, I've, I've roughed it for half a decade while we build a house and a farm and all that sort of thing. And it's it's a lot of work. And so I appreciate the comforts of modern society much more than I did half a decade ago. I love that idea of balance, what we're calling for, you know, people like us and what we're trying to bring about to the world is a sense of balance in just small little ways, even just how you approach, you know, foods that you buy and how you approach uh, animals that you live with, even, you know, so I appreciate that. That's really cool. When you were communicating with the seals, were you communicating with their uh, collective conscious or just like a select few seals? Beautiful question. Their collective consciousness. Oh, I, I refer to it, Alyssa, as the Council of, so the Council of Seals, the Council of Horses, or the, I call it the Equine Council, or the oh. Feline Council, or the Canine Council. But yes, it's the collective spirit of that group. I, yes, I could co- talk to you know, individual seals and have done so. But if I'm, if we're into these, you know, bigger subjects, if you will, um, it's that, it's that group consciousness. Mm -hmm. Have you done the collective, uh, the equine council? Like many times. Well, the equine council is every, all of them, but of course there, there are the Mustangs, there are the quarter horses, there are the Lipizzaners, there are the Arabians there, you you know, so there are the groups talk to any like mustangs that have have they talked to you about their take on the roundups and their no i haven't i haven't actually had that conversation with them interesting that's something i'm like beyond fascinated and fascinated kind of in a bad way like i don't agree with the roundups um i have two previously wild mustangs but that's like i don't know it's a calling of mine i'm very curious about uh, about the horses, you know, about the horses in general, but their their take on that and how it really affects them, because I I know it doesn't affect them positively. No, you're um, right. It's it's a very any time you are taking animals from the wild in such a violent way, with disrespect, with not honoring their agency to live their lives, um, that's a problem, and that is a problem for the humans who do that. In other words, it's it's not a good energy for anybody involved in that, whether it's the horse or the P, the BLM, um, you know, whomever. And um, you, as you know, there's a lot of politics involved with that, which have to do with the range belonging to the ranchers and their cattle, which is, is that fair <laughs> uh, yeah. to the wildlife? Absolutely not. So there's a problem right there. There's an imbalance right there. And the fact that much of the predators, the natural balance between the horses and their predators has also been disrupted and forcing the horses on a narrower and narrower range is problematic because then they, without their predators, will denude the landscape and starve, right? There are these, all these interconnected pieces. That's the, that is the beauty of our planet. And that's, but, but to restore the balance, we must take into account those pieces. Right. Yeah. Balance is such an integral part of living and evolving and becoming better. To exist in an equilibrium. Our physical bodies do it all the time. We're always creating balance within ourselves. And if we don't, we enter into the state of disease and ultimately die. Um, The planet is just a, I feel like each individual physical body is more or less a microcosm of the universe. There you go. So, you know. I so would agree with that. <laughs> if if we lack in in balance individually and then collectively, then everything gets out of whack and we have all sorts of problems. And we just happen to be living in the day and age of experiencing a lot of those problems. One of the things you've mentioned that I jotted down as you were talking that the horses, they remind us of connection. Can you elaborate on that a bit? I mean, Alyssa and I definitely have our own take, but 
curious what you have to say. Absolutely. If I go back to that concept of merging, of becoming one being, this is that great gift that they give us, uh, that where separation completely dissolves. This is, I think they do this, this is again one of their special gifts. I mean, you can experience this with a cat or a dog, but it takes, it takes really going in and with a horse, though, it's it can be so automatic, um, and I it, and it has to do somewhat with the fact that they're herd animals. So cats and dogs are predators, right? Dogs are pack animals. Cats are not. Cats are individual beings. Um, so you get there's you know what the pack and the herd bring is different, um, meaning humans are pack animals. We are, we are community oriented beings as dogs and horses are. So there's that in common. But when you have a prey animal, meaning the horse, they have to watch out and care for each other in, in very different ways than the wolf pack, let's say. Okay. So what that means is, and I'll describe this, I, I describe this in one of my books, the way the energy patterns work within the horse herd. So what happens is, the lead mare is really the leader of the herd. The, the stallion is, he is, so the lead mare is like the heart of the herd. She is the center of the herd. And around her and around every single horse in the herd is an energy field. In some cases, people call it the aura. We all have one. Every living creature does. Um, and so do rocks. And so, you know, so it's an energy field. So that energy field in a prey animal works like kind of a, uh, early warning system or an antenna system that goes all around them so that they can be aware of any kind of threat, right? They can perceive it energetically, feel it in the air, if you will. Beyond their ability to smell and see and hear is this whole other layer of uh, sensitivity, okay? So each horse within the herd has their own, but then the lead mare throws an extra level of energy around the entire herd. And it becomes like a bubble all around the herd. So that as the herd moves, that bubble follows them. And it becomes an extra boundary of protection, if you will, of early warning. So that if it's a wolf, a mountain lion or whatever, you know, somebody's going to pick it up on the edge of that field and warn everyone else. It'll instantly go through everybody's energy field like an electrical charge and they'll move away. <laughs> okay. So what also, so that is a layer of protection. It is, every member of the herd has it. And, and what's fascinating is if a colt, and it's usually a boy, <laughs> it's rare that it's a filly, a colt gets feisty and pissy and is being kicky and bitey and being a pain, that lead mare is going to kick him outside that bubble. And that is the scariest thing she can do. Because now here's this youngster outside that protective bubble. And he is so vulnerable. And he, you know, usually he goes, oh, <laughs> oh no. And, and, and he, he has to ask her permission. Can, can, he, can I come back, please? And she'll say, are you going to behave? You say, yes, 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 I promise. Okay, you're back in, buddy. Don't pull that crap again. <laughs> so, mm. um, and then, of course, the stallion can come in and out of that bubble because he's part of it, but he often will be in his own bubble as a scout, right? Watching and looking and paying attention to other herds and other, other stallions. And there's this, you know, beautiful, intricate dance. So when you as the rider, Alyssa, open your heart in love and trust to Willow, she envelops you in her field, just like that. And now you are part of her heard, even if it's just the two of you, you are together in that beautiful bubble of love and protection and connection. And that's where that merging takes place. So when you then completely let your ego go and just, you're just, you just be in that space with her, your boundaries disappear, her boundaries disappear, and you are one, like one being, oh, right? Yes. Oh, yes. That is beautiful. That's I, I the gift. That on so many different levels with her, particularly. Yeah, and I, I've ridden a few horses, and I mean, not 
a crazy amount of horses, but I feel like she, that, that connection with her is something I cannot explain. It's just, it's got to be the best, most comfortable, calming, magical feeling I've ever felt. And it happens every time I get on her. (laughs) (laughs) And that's because she, you both are meeting each other there. You both have to go there. You both have to want to go there. Because like you say, you've ridden other horses who may have been closed because they didn't know you well. Well, I was They, they didn't. And, well, there you go. Me. Yeah, because if you're closed, they're going to be closed, right? <laughs> so, yes, yes. You know, a therapy horse will open to the people that they're trying to help. In other words, they will say, I know what my, my job here is. My, my job is to open my heart and and connect to those people because that's a healing experience just like you saw her light up that her whole energy field expands and and vibrates in this golden light which is you know healing to all of her cells we're talking about you (laughs) all of your cells light up when willow and you connect like that therapy horses do that they they deliberately even though they don't haven't built that trust and haven't don't know it so well they with the other people, they just are old souls who say, I'm here to help heal. So I'm this is my job and I'm gonna do it. And that's where that that's how they help all the humans they do. We had a special moment not long ago. It was like a week ago, I think. We watched the um the Wild Beauty film. If you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. It's uh it, it was created by Ashley Avis. Um, and it was a documentary on basically the the roundups and what's going on within the uh, the whole controversy and stuff like that. So they basically became um, investigative reporters and did a documentary on it. Anyway, so we watched that film and it was very, very moving. Uh, so spoiler alert. I mean, we were quite emotional over it. We got up and silently walked out the 400 feet or so from the house to the horse's paddock. And we just both, and it was at nighttime, we just both sat down in the paddock and the three horses came and they formed a circle around us. They touched noses, like each of them. Yeah. And they were 100% no doubt about it. They were communicating about us and the feelings that they were feeling. And they, they wrapped us in, I can't explain it any other way than this energetic cocoon hug force field. And we just sat there and they just showered us with that. It was so fascinating. Have you ever had any sort of experiences like that? Either in or outside of your communication sessions? When I was, when I was, uh, um, so just a, a little bit of background. So when I was little, as I mentioned to you, I was wide open and I had, um, and I, I would, I was a first child. So I was very verbal, even at like age two. <laughs> and so I would tell everybody, you know, Oh, the rose bush said this. And, and my mom and dad had a, a black and white kitty who, you know, when I was a baby kind of took off because I was like, kitty, kitty. You know, <laughs> and so she had to take me in small doses. But as I got older, you know, we developed a rapport. But um, so I, when I was three, my dad gave me a kitten, and his name was Dusty. This is there's a little bit about this in in on my website um, about my journey. And um, Dusty said to me, you know, because by, by that point, my parents were getting a little concerned about me talking about, you know, it was cute, but then. I would say things like, so-and-so really hates her husband. And they'd go, where did you get such a crazy idea? That's not true. And I'd be like, uh-oh, we're supposed to, I'm not supposed to believe what I'm receiving. I'm supposed to believe what people say. That's tricky. Um, so I, you know, I was kind of in a quandary, but my cat basically said, okay, I'm here. We're going to do this together, but it's probably better that you not share this with your parents because they can't understand and I, I, I remember feeling both sad and relieved at the same time. And so he and I began this incredible journey together. And, um, but it only lasted three years because when I went to school in kindergarten, I would come home. It was a half day school and I'd tell him 
all about my adventures or, you know, what everybody else was doing. I wasn't that interested really um, in participating, but I was very interested in telling him about it. And then in first grade, it was another half day. He, he came, it was October and he crawled into bed with me as he usually did and said, um, you know, I'm very proud of you. You've done so well. And our time together uh, is, is done. And I just fell asleep feeling loved and I'm happy that I made him proud but then when I woke up in the morning, he wasn't on my bed. And this was, he was an indoor outdoor cat. And I had, I started to develop this very bad feeling. And I'm going to shorten the story. Long story short, he went out and got hit by a car. And I was devastated. I mean, like, I can't imagine life without him. He's my best friend. He's the only one that understands, you know. And so um, I got very sick. And thought, well, maybe this is better because I can die and just be out of here because nobody, I don't know how to relate to these people. I mean, my door, the way I perceived it was I had this door open and everybody else's were closed. There were people around me that loved animals, but nobody, anyway, so I got very sick and got tonsillitis and went to have my tonsils taken out. And um, I went under anesthesia. And I had this experience of being lifted up and held close and like a baby. And as I kind of nestled in, I smelled and felt his fur. And I heard him say, your work isn't done. You, you have work to do. You still need to be here. And I'll always be with you. And I, the next thing I remember is I came out, you know, with a really, really sore throat and family around me being nice and giving me ice cream. But I thought, okay, I didn't come back with like, oh, yay, I am so glad to stay. And no, I didn't do that. I went, okay, I'm supposed to be here. How do I do this? How do I cope? And I decided to shut it all down. I, I was a survival mechanism. I have to shut this down. I can't be open like this. So by the time I was eight, I shut it all down. So fast forward. <laughs> so I did everything, you know, I went to school and, and I, you know, fit in and did my best to be normal. <laughs> but I could never forget that he and I had had very deep conversations, not just conversations between a little girl and a cat, but questions about life and the universe. And But I didn't tell anybody. Um, so then I was in my early 20s and I went to therapy just to deal with the usual stuff. And I found that I had basically removed this part of me, the feminine, intuitive little girl, and kind of imprisoned her in a big tower to keep her safe, ostensibly. <laughs> and my therapist said, you need to reintegrate her. You need to bring her back. And I'm like, okay. So I had to work at that because she didn't really want to come out because it was pretty scary out here. So I said, I promise I'll take care of you. And now I'm a grown woman. You know, I know I'm not you know, I'm not that, I'm not vulnerable like that anymore. I know who I am. It's okay. And I'd always been interested in spiritual growth and learning and, you know, all things metaphysical and, you know, I, that all fascinated me. So, um, that didn't leave me. And so as I worked to integrate this part of me, I began to receive again, but not from my dog. I had a dog at that point from the trees. It was the trees that first came to me mm. and taught me how to listen again. So I was like 20, I was in my mid twenties and I was in Washington, DC working for a conservation organization um, because that I was passionate about the environment um, and the planet. And, um, but then I had an opportunity to go to Santa Fe and that's Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that's when things really popped open. So it was, so the, so I, I, I was woo woo in where woo woo was in my kind of woo woo wasn't really part of Washington DC. So, but back in Santa Fe with native American people, with all the, you know, new age, more spiritual people, people who were seeking people who were learning that was fine to develop that ability there. And again, I had enough confidence in myself and because I remembered that I wasn't crazy. When I was started to hear the trees, there was a whole part of me that just went, oh, this is so right. I'm, I'm coming home. So that's how that worked, Jason. I, I, I couldn't like 
be woo woo throughout my whole life because there was, it would have been way too painful, way too awkward, way too, you know, my father. Mm -mm. Is there any <laughs> Just, sort of particular spiritual practice that you found <clears throat> helps get you into that position or? <clears throat> Is it a position at all? Does it just constantly flow if you're like around an animal and they've opened up to you? Well, learning to quiet the mind is a very helpful thing because our minds get in the way of this. Okay. So it's really, in my opinion, it is an, it's an action of the heart and the heart is, is where our intuitive muscle is. I mean, some people describe that it is the third eye and that's fine. Whatever, you know, it doesn't matter whatever works for you. But for me, the intuition is the voice of the heart. The heart is where we have wisdom. The mind is where we have intellect. And intellect is duality. And that is what, you know, in our society is all the thing. You know, um, the intuition, the feeling, the, the all of this is, you know, again, has been put down. And, uh, you know, for, for it's the feminine part of us, the receiving part. So the yin and yang, right, is the balance of the masculine and feminine, the active principle and the receiving principle. Well, our society is very yang, all about the masculine doing. But with this feminine now on the rise, and why is it on the rise? Well, one theory is because from the year one to the year 1999, it was the energy of one. So we're working with numerology here. So everything adds up to one. And one is the energy of the masculine, me, mine. You know, so if you just think of everything revolved around me and mine, I want what you have. I'm going to take it. Um, now I have more stuff than you have, and I have more this, and I have more that, and I'm better, me, mine. And then, of course, a lot of, there was a lot of invention and amazing things happened between the year one and 1999. However, with the dawning of the 2000, was the energy of the two. Two is the feminine. It's the we. It's the us. And so that energy has been coming, becoming stronger, but that energy of the one is doing everything it can to hold its power, right? We see that all over the world. The energy of the masculine, way out of whack. Woo! Just way out of whack, right? We see it all over the place. And doesn't mean it's only in men. There's some women who are all about power and me and mine, right? So <clears throat> that... Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be a gender-specific no. thing, which no. I, in my life, uh, you know, 40-plus years on, on this planet, I always thought it was gender-specific. Um, I have recently found that it's not, and the, the horses, to me provide such they're they're like the epiphany of balance of the masculine and feminine that's beautifully said and they, they do yeah they demonstrate that to us in a way that i haven't seen from any other animal or species really but well you can hang around with some more <laughs> some more species and you'll see because <laughs> they manifest that balance in so many different ways, but they do They're Again, it gets back to our conversations about balance. So my point about the two though, is, is that the feminine is on the rise, the feminine in the masculine, whether it's in a masculine body, the feminine is the intuitive, the knowing, the wisdom, the allowing, the surrender. We were just talking about Alyssa with the surrendering of the ego. That's a feminine thing that many male riders do in order to have that partnership with their horses you know mm -hmm. that's what the native native people and the and the um argentinian uh cowboys the gauchos and the mongolian tribesmen they had this partnership with their horse whether they were a man or a woman that was about that surrender and that's a very feminine thing that's not a masculine action it's a you know we don't have a better word for a feminine action action is a masculine term because it's a doing right and receiving is a is this kind of thing which is how animal communication is it's a receiving it's not a doing the more you try the harder you try the more you're pushing it away you have to allow it to come to you i hear that so you said a thing early on about the there being the the three main like animals the dog the cat and the horse is there any sort of like significance in having all three do they do they work together 
to make our world more, I don't know, in, insightful. That's lovely. Um, I think that there's a beauty in having all three because they, they express that, that love and they give their lessons in very different ways. So there is definitely a gift in living with all three. But again, some people are drawn to the energy of the horse more than the dog or the cat. So it's, it's nice to have the variety of the, of, of three very different kinds of beings, um, who, who can help us in their very special ways. We have, I love that. Yeah. We have dogs, cats, horses. I mean, we have so many animals, but I mean, I, I am drawn to the horses primarily just like it, it just, yeah, strikes a question. Just curious because the dogs, I mean, they, they integrate pretty well, you know, just physically, but I haven't, I guess I've never like been in a communication session with, say my dog ginger and my horse willow or whatever so i'm i'm curious if they you know they communicate on their own energy levels and i don't know just help try to assist the family as much as they can as a whole animal species they do they're they're all helping they're all helping your family absolutely um and you can actually ask them to include you in a conversation because the dogs and the horses and the cats are going to talk to each other, just like the chickens and the, you know, everybody else, the cows, the sheep, you know, the, the difference is, as I said, that those three species, the way it was shared with me was, and you'll, you'll love this story that in the beginning <laughs> there was a, when, when every, every being was a spark of light of the divine and individuated from the divine consciousness into something, bee, butterfly, elephant, dolphin, whale, horse, dog, bear, chicken, <laughs> robin, right? Everything. There was a, that the, all the species would come together around the council fire to share their experiences in those, in those bodies, those unique experiences. So for example, the bee talked about the dance with the flowers and the cheetah talked about running in the, with the speed and the air. And the dolphins talked about their merging with the sea and the air and all of this. And they brought this to share with one another, to, to share this conversation about what it's like to live a life in this beautiful form. And humans were sitting there listening and thought, well, okay, the cheetah can do this really speedy thing. And you know, we can't do what the pollen, what the bees do, and we don't swim like a dog. What do we have? Oh, we have this mind. We have this very developed intellect. Well, we'll go out and explore that, and then we'll bring our stories back to the council fire to share. So humans went off to explore their minds. But in the process, one of the things that happened was they started to separate more and more, and they started to get very attached to their own way of thinking and their own way of doing things. And they became more, and they were moving further and further away from the other species. And there was a big chasm that was growing. And the other animals said, well, you know, the humans are going to have to find their way. They'll figure it out one way or the other. But three species said, we're going to help. We are going to merge our destinies with them. And we are going to love them. And we're going to show them how to find the way home. And it was. The, the dog, the cat, and the horse. So they they made a an investment in us, if you will, to help us home. And th there are still individual animals who are chickens or guinea pigs or hawks or wolves who will love and connect to a person. And, but it's not all chickens, <laughs> you know, or or all guinea pigs. It's that it's a special one on one. But these three have this overarching service and it's not to us although it serves us hugely it's to the divine that's beautiful where does that story originate from it came it was given to me but it isn't just mine because i have heard it told from other traditions but i didn't hear it from any other tradition the it was given to me by the council gotcha. of animals fascinating that's so you'll find it, I love I, it. you know there's there's other, there's tribes and indigenous people have similar stories. Yeah. I love it. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> so, 
So where can people uh, find you at, Kate, if they want to <laughs> connect with you more? And I'm easy. It's just my name, katesolisti.com is my website. And, um, and I have, you know, I do individual sessions with people and their animals. And, and then my great love is my community where we, what we do is we don't just, I don't just bring through the messages. What we're doing now is we're learning from the animals. So what that means is, for example, today is our second meeting with the deer council. And so last week I brought through the energy of the deer council and I asked all of my, my pack members to write down what from that communication jumped out at them as something they want to work with, they want to bring into their lives, they want to integrate into their their work, their relationships, their lives, and work with it this week, and then come back tomorrow when we meet again and share what's changed, what's different, what's new. And now this is our fifth month, sorry, stork, wolves, hummingbirds, bears. Yes, this is our fifth month of doing this. And I, I started it this way because the messages we were receiving were very beautiful. I have over a hundred recorded messages from different councils. And sometimes we repeat and go back and talk to the dolphins again or whomever. But I felt like the animals were giving us these amazing messages and gifts and people were saying, oh, that's so beautiful. But they weren't really growing. They weren't. And that's what the animals need us to do, as we spoke about earlier, is to wake up and remember our connection. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? First, we have to get in touch with who we are. And if animal, and there's many paths to this, you know, people have studied um, conversations with God. That is a, that is a, a workbook and a way of learning how to connect, of course, through different tra- uh, religious traditions, uh, of course, through different spiritual traditions and different teachings and philosophies. There's so many ways of growing and learning, but for people who would love to work with the animals and learn from them as their teachers, and the Native American people have always called the animals our teachers, um, that's what my pack is about. So in the five, this is again the fifth month, and the growth and and shifting that my the pack is doing is so heart render. It's just, I am so overjoyed because their, their vibrations are shifting. They're making different choices. One woman quit a job that was just draining her. Others, you know, stopped relationships that were really not good. Others began relationships that were better. Others began speaking their truth. Everybody's light is growing brighter and brighter. And as that happens, it affects all the other beings around them, animals, plants, You know, so people's ability to communicate is growing with their own animals. So this is, this is my passion. And I'm not the only communicator who's doing this. My dear friend, Cara Gubbins has what she calls her animal wisdom circles. P. Horsley in England. I think she calls it the pride, which is fun. We've got the pack and the pride. Um, and so we are as a, as a group, some of us communicators are saying we need to find a way to, uh, to, to facilitate the animal's teachings. And th- this is the way I'm doing it, is through this, this format. So that, that is my, my Harmony Pack. It's all on my website. So I, I, and oh, that's great. I love it. I love it all. I'm very grateful, very, very grateful to be able to have this. I don't even, it's, it's, it's a mission. It's, it's, <laughs> it's more than a career. Yeah. It's more than a lifestyle. It's, it's, it's all about love and uh, helping people find their way home through the beauty and love and wisdom of the animals. Oh, that's fantastic. We'll definitely put links out uh, to your website so people can find that. You wrote the Conversations with Horses book, didn't you? I have that book on my reading list. It's been one that I'm like really excited to start reading. So I will tell you it's hard to find. It was the first I of have my it. Com- Oh, she's got it. Yay! I Okay. I found it at a, at a library thing a while ago, and I just haven't started reading it. But it's been like calling to me, and it's like, read me, read me. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna read you. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> excited. <laughs> I'm so glad because yes, that book of the three conversations books, of course, the dog, the I cat, and the it. horse, right? They um, that one sold out first, and and there were per- per- issues with printers and publishers, and that was a mess. But I'm so glad you found it. That's what matters. And um, dog and cat are easier to find. 
In fact, I have copies of both of those. I mean, multiple copies, but of course I only have a few and I treasure them because, (laughs) but I don't know if you know the, um, the, the, um, Wonderful photographer, Tony Stromberg. Does that ring a bell? He has, he's a horse photographer. Oh, you both would love his work. Tony oh, Stromberg. Okay. And actually he, the, um, Amber Lotus is a publishing house and they're doing a calendar, a horse calendar. Well, I think they do them every year. Anyway, I have a, 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 one of my quotes because he did the, he did the photography in conversations with horse. Then he did a beautiful big coffee table book of horses that you must check out. You will love that. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're going to be, I think 2024 is the calendar that they're going to have a couple of quotes from conversations with horse in, um, which just warms my heart, but, um, yes, enjoy it. You will enjoy it. Alyssa, I know you will. And I'm just so grateful to meet the two of you and to see as father and daughter that you're doing this together and just, yes, you're spreading the light. And you're, you're helping people just like listening to me, Alyssa has reinforced and confirmed. And for you too, Jason, so much of what you already know and what you're doing, that's part of my mission too, is just be normal. You know, friends in the, or people in the beginning said, well, I, I expected you to show up with a crystal ball and a, you know, and a kerchief and big earrings and <laughs> no, I'm not a gypsy. I'm just a regular <laughs> person who grew up yeah, in New Jersey. I think- I think a lot of the stereotypes are are fading away, and it, it it's a good feeling. Um, and I I think a lot of people, yeah, I, we could go on a completely another discussion, but I, I just feel like a lot of people are moving into different realms of being, myself included. I mean, I I never thought in a million years I'd be sitting uh, hosting a podcast called reinforce the horse <laughs> <laughs> and i do have a mailing list and i do a newsletter most almost every week um a short newsletter it can be about communication yeah, we'll nutrition, sure. yes, all yes. of that good stuff so i i love having people sign up there is when you sign up there's a little free gift that is my uh Very steps cool. to communication and yeah. so i i love to again just give everybody the opportunity to open their hearts and connect more deeply so I thank you both for everything yeah. you're doing and who you are. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. 